Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. The room is very full, mashallah. <laughs> I'd like to start my paper today by providing a definition of this symposium's topic, namely Norse's concept of Musbet Harakat, in my opinion, rather misleadingly translated as positive action. A quick look into search engines will show us that positive action in Europe is understood as the promotion of people based on belonging to non-majority identity groups in the workplace, educational institutions, and positions in society without prejudicing the criteria of selection by merit. In other words, it is related to discrimination at workplace, the right of minorities, etc. Nursi, on the other hand, would define Musbet Harakat as constructive or creative effort of which the meaning would be a creative effort that is in line with God's will, that is not destructive and or aggressive, but rather constructive, that is conform with balance, equilibrium, justice, and fairness. Therefore, I will henceforth use the term creative effort um, when I talk about Musbet Harakat. I argue in my paper that Nursi's extensive work offers a lot of pastoral theology. Pastoral theology is a recognized theological discipline within the Christian tradition, but it is not a discipline in its own right within Muslim theology. This, however, does not mean that it is completely non-existent within Muslim tradition. On the contrary, it has a very long history among Muslim thinkers and writers especially among Sufis and mystics who wrote extensively on the soul, but it went by another name, hikmah, meaning wisdom. Nursi's pastoral theology is an attempt to cultivate wisdom by enabling the afflicted to see God behind every event, thereby encouraging them to see their problems, trials, and tribulations as coming from the divine will. This is why the figure of Ayyub, Ayyub alayhi salam, is so important, for he underwent the most terrible sufferings and yet was sustained by his faith in God. Examining Nursi's treatment of Ayyub alayhi salam in the Risale Nur thus provides a useful means for eliciting the pastoral theological dimension of Nursi's thought. To enable us to identify the different facets of Nursi's pastoral theology, we shall follow Colin Turner's suggestion that Nursi's approach to practical theology can be best described within the framework of what the modern theorist Richard Osmer describes as the four key questions and tasks of a pastoral theologian. Namely, the first one, the question, what is happening? The second one, why is this happening? The third question, what ought to be happening? And the fourth question, how might we act to facilitate this? So let's start with the first question, what is happening? And by answering this question, I will talk about Nursi's view on Ayyub salam. Nursi emphasizes on many occasions in his works the importance of patience, sabr, to spiritual well-being. It is in this context that he introduces the figure of Ayyub salam. The entire second flash in the Flashes collection is dedicated to Prophet Ayyub salam, wherein Nursi comments on his famous supplication in the Quran Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Rabbi inni masaniyat durru wa anta arhamur rahimin. Translated as, O oh Lord, harm has afflicted me. My remembrance of you with my tongue and my worship of you with my heart will suffer. And you are the most merciful of the merciful. At the beginning of the second flash, Nursi explains briefly what happened to Ayyub. Afflicted with numerous griefs and afflictions, including the loss of his wealth and offspring, Ayyub suffers severe physical illnesses 
all of which he bears with extraordinary patience and fortitude. Only at the point when his wounds start threatening his ability to connect with God, does he ask for God's mercy with this famous supplication. According to Nursi, Ayyub seems not to complain at all, despite his losses and the pain he endures in his own body, up until the point when his illness starts affecting his heart and tongue. Ayyub now is afraid that, that he will lose his bond with his Lord. It is at this point that he asks his Lord to lift the hardship from him, not for his own comfort, but for the, uh, for the sake of his worship um, of God. Nursi believes that this invocation of Job is one of the most effective of all prayers because it is made with the deepest sincerity and is an invocation motivated not by self-interest, but by Job's desire to continue to worship and serve his Lord. For Nursi, Job's supplication belongs to the category of invocation made at a time of desperate need. Ayub made his invocation with a tongue of pure, sincere heart, which according to Nursi is ritually always acceptable. Ayub al-Islam's invocation did not have a worldly purpose. It rather was a purely spiritual concern and was accepted by God in the best of ways. Furthermore, Nursi would certainly agree, any form of supplication is a creative effort, a musbet harikat. For a supplication comprises the awareness of one's own helplessness and asking a higher being to bring something into existence that is not or seems not to be existent at this particular moment. And existence in itself, by definition, is pure goodness, khair mahs. We can also see Nursi's positive and constructive approach towards a person's seemingly desperate viewpoint of unanswered prayers and supplications. For he says, a doctor will either give you exactly what you have asked for, or he will give you something that is better than what you have asked for, or after examining you, he will decide to give you nothing at all, which also in itself is an answer. Coming to the next question, why is this happening? The story of Job makes the reader question God's justice and compassion, and is an example par excellence of the problem of evil and theodicy. Although the Quranic account does not reveal any sort of struggle on Job's side to reconcile his faith in God with the psychological and physical suffering he undergoes on the sudden loss of his wealth, his children, and finally the loss of his own health, nevertheless, this does not invalidate the struggle any person would go through in a Yub alayhi place. In this respect, Yub embodies and reflects all the above problems in his own life. The question that will be asked here is whether the Quranic definition of shar corresponds to evil as it is understood by so many. This question, in return, poses another question, namely whether a Yub alayhi calamities and inflictions can be described as shar in the Quranic sense of the term. In the Quran, the term shar is usually translated into English as evil. However, there is a difference between the definition of shar in the Quran and evil as it is understood by so many. While in Western thought, evil is mainly interpreted as moral evil, evils committed by human beings, and natural evil, such as hurricanes, earthquakes, etc., the Quranic view of shar is different. Shar, according to the Quran, is the loss of God's grace, loss of guidance, loss of God's resignation, loss of understanding, loss of faith, loss of patience, and loss of hope. In other words, the Quran defines shar 
to be cer certain attributes such as parsimony, going astray, rejecting being ungrateful to God, idolatry, violating a covenant or treaty, turning away aversion from God, slander, and transgression. In other words, one might say that shar is defined in the, uh, as the opposite of musbet hareket, the opposite of creative effort, that is to act in a destructive, unjust, unfair, and aggressive manner. Shar, like khair, goodness, does not make a statement about wrong or right, but rather about the benefit or loss that an action or a situation brings. In the case of Shar, the addressee in all circumstances is that person who chooses, who chooses himself to be foolish, arrogant, stubborn, ignorant, impatient, and unwise. What is described as Shar is the loss that is behind such behavior. Contrary to the term natural evil, there is no such thing as natural Shar in the Quran. Shar is rather a relative term that can change according to every single individual. A loss that someone suffers and which that person considers as being evil for him can be a benefit, hence something good for someone else. Or a negative situation now that a person thinks is evil can turn out for him to be good in the long run. Death, which has been considered by scholars such as Thomas Hobbes as the worst of evils can be seen as necessary and good from Nursi's perspective. In the light of all the above, it becomes clear that the Quranic definition of shar is different from the common understanding of evil. That is to say, the Quranic's def Quran's definition of shar corresponds to so-called moral evil described by Ninian Smart as human wickedness and which is according to Platinga the, the result of human choice or volition. So what about Yob? What about Ayyub, Ayyub salam? Can his calamities and inflictions be called shar? Nursi would say that all the material loss, the loss of his family and his own health, does not fall into the Quranic definition of shar. At that instant, when it was about to turn into shar, namely when Ayyub was afraid of not being able to commune with his Lord anymore. His supplication was accepted and all his wealth and family and health was restored. Thus one might say that Ayyub was wise enough to realize what really mattered. He truly lived up to the verse, everything shall perish save his countenance. His is the command, and to him shall you return. The why question, however, still remains. Even if all these inflictions and calamities, by definition, are not shar, why would an absolute compassionate, omnipotent, omniscient God allow human beings, whom he loves so much, grows, go through such uh, tremendous pain? Nursi approaches the problem of evil from many different perspectives. However, the time is limited now and I can't go into those in more detail. What I will do, however, is talk about Nursi's approach to the issue of physical illnesses, calamities and inflictions. A again, from the example of uh, Ayyub salam, and what he went through. So firstly, throughout his works, Nursi fundamentally establishes, and this is very important, because I think it's unique to you know, him. He fundamentally establishes a theory that has been called by Choban, divine names theology. According to this theory, everything in this universe is the manifestation and mirror of the divine names and attributes of God. In this respect, Nursi constitutes a whole new Weltanschauung that is designed to link literally everything and every event with a reference to the names and attributes of God. And Shar is included to this, calamities and so on. Thus, Nursi is arguably the first scholar to establish a relationship between theodicy and the divine names of God. According to this concept, God's jamali, 
Butchis, as well as his glorious Jalali names together in unity, form a divine mosaic pointing to their creator. Nursi's second approach is related to God being Malik al-Mulk, in other words, the true owner or possessor of everything, including human beings. Humankind falsely assumes that the human body and all its faculties and feelings belong to itself, that it is the owner of itself. God, however, is the true owner, and he holds sway over his possession as he wishes and changes everything as he pleases. Well, at first sight, this statement is quite bold, for it implies that God can treat human beings in any way he wishes. Even the cruelest experience is khayr. Nursi is in line with Ghazali here. God cannot do wrong, zulm, for by definition, wrongdoing consists in dealing unjustly with the property of others. But God is the owner of everything, and nobody is in possession of anything God could deal unjustly with. Nursi would share the thought that as with the example of Ayyub, human beings can be capable of seeing illnesses and calamities as khayr. In other words, see behind the veil, but only if they have the wisdom to do so. Others who have trust in God but lack wisdom might not see the beauty within ugliness, but they will still reassure themselves that there must be some beauty behind it. Only those who are totally ignorant will look and judge according to the apparent and will blame God or will even become hostile to their creator. Thus here again, Nursi calls his reader to perform musbet harakat, creative efforts, to ask God for the necessary wisdom to be able to see the true good meaning of events. Thirdly, Nursi touches on the importance of life not passing by monotoniously, for if life passed in a permanent state of health and well-being, it would become a deficient mirror. It would reduce life's value and transform its pleasure into distress. Fourthly, I've got one, two more points and then I'm done. Yes. Fourthly, Nursi talks about a world of duality and opposites. He believes that the combination, confrontation, and interpretation of opposites in creation, such as khair and shar, pain and pleasure, light and darkness, heat and cold, beauty and ugliness, and guidance and misguidance manifest God's wisdom, divine wisdom, and indicate God's unity. Fifthly, Nursi asserts that illness can influence social life in a positive way, for it prompts respect and compassion. An ill person is being saved from self-sufficiency, which can derive him to unsociableness and unkindness. Nursi bases his argument on the Quran, which reads, indeed man transgresses all bounds, in that he looks upon himself as self-sufficient. And sixthly, Nursi asserts that, all Ill, uh, uh, that an ill person has no right to complain, for complaint arises from a right. However, Nursi continues, none of a sick person's right has been lost. On the contrary, there are numerous unperformed tasks and thanks which are an obligation on the person. Without having performed these thanks, Nursi explains, that is, without having given God his due, the sick person is complaining as though demanding rights in a manner that is not rightful. Lastly, what I would like to say is, um, this paper has tried to concentrate on the whole aspect of pastoral theology. And um, I believe in, in the importance of it because I think that uh, it brings the whole issue down into practical, into the practical um, aspect of how to deal with the problems of current society. Now, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent me a great gift. I have been introduced to uh, Dr. T uh, Brother Taha, who has just given a presentation on, from the psychological aspect of things. Because when we talk about pastoral theology, um, it is very necessary that the psychological aspect will uh, come into play as well. So hopefully in the future we can also um, work together and um, uh, bring something uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, forth, inshallah. Thank you very much for listening. Assalamu alaikum.